and live. At least I think that we are. Tim and Chuck are both MIA. Uh, so uh, we're going to wing it today. See what we can do. I don't like that. I gotta get a new camera. Nobody needs to see the hand like that. That's insane. Alright. Let me unhost that. Okay, I am assuming that we are live. Uh, we will wait before we dive into anything. We are here for GM's Tricks of the Trade. Number 60-something or the other. We got our numbering all goofed up. Um, and um, we're talking about monsters in the horror genre today. We'll wait for confirmation that uh, my video and audio is working. Very cool. I think Tim might be wandering back. <sighs> uh, Tim, do we got sound? Do we got video? What's going on? You got anything? Am I even live? I think I'm live. Don't know GM's tricks of the trade. Uh, 65. All right. Thanks, DM Samuel. <laughs> I, yeah, it's been a crazy, another crazy week here. But, um, but we always persevere. We hear and see you. Good deal. All right. How's it going, night, big DM, everybody? <sighs> yeah. <laughs> I think... I think really we probably need to reassess what the norm is. I think that we all, Tim has joined us. I think that we all live such, I don't think the internet's helped. I think, I don't know, we all live such complicated and seemingly never ending distractions of our lives that uh, every time you talk to someone, is, <laughs> it's a crazy week. And I can't help but think that, you know, 100 years ago when, you were just farming in the hot in the hot August sun that um, maybe it was a little simpler. wasn't easier by any stretch of the imagination, but maybe it was a little simpler. <laughs> maybe maybe the weeks weren't so crazy. I remember when we were driving through a few years ago, me and my family were driving through Wyoming, and it and I kind of intellectually knew this, but I, I, the realization really kind of sunk in too, just looking at the terrain for hour after hour after hour after hour of driving. And it doesn't really change, and you can start seeing landmarks, you know, mountains or what have you, uh, on the horizon that stay there. Now, I, and I can completely understand why someone who traveled by wagon or horse or by foot uh, could learn the lay of the land quite very, very well, because they stared at it for seven days before they, <laughs> before they actually got to it. So your brain just absorbs all of that detail. Norma went out the window last March. Yeah, you're right, you're right there, Vic, without a doubt. Uh, it it might have already been I, I think um, tumbling out. We we've uh, I've been watching. My daughter joins me. She's actually so I've been watching the X Files of season one, and I'm on season five now. And uh, my daughter joined, watched three or four episodes, and she's in her twenties, and she just absolutely loved it. Then with got with her boyfriend and started the whole thing over again. So I've been watching the X Files with her and and on my own, and I don't know even it just seems. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe this is just me. You know, the internet those days and computers those days was this specialized thing. Only really uh, people really, really into computers could do the DOS and all of that googly goo. Uh, you know, and actually work computer. I mean, just open AOL or what have you, but actually worked the computer uh, as a machine. And the phones, of course, were just a telephone. It was it was mobile. Of course, you could take it anywhere, but it was that big big gigantic thing you know attached to your head um as opposed to today i mean this is not a telephone there's there's no part of this no part of it's just not it's there is a tiny little app on here that acts like a telephone but people don't use it uh and it's really a computer it's a very small computer but uh, uh so, so now we've swapped the telephone with the computer in our pocket and i'm not sure I'm not sure that doesn't cause more problems than it solves. Though, if you broke down on the highway at 3 o'clock in the morning, I'm certain that, uh, you know, it'll be more 
be more useful than not. There was more computing power in the phone in my pocket than there was in the first space. <laughs> That's kind of sad. But not surprising. I mean, it's absolutely nuts. I, for one, welcome the new normal of our viral overlords. <laughs> yeah, right? That's what it seems like. And there seems to be no, there's no direction. I mean, it's it's so funny watching. Uh, it's funny and it's not funny. It's funny and a macabre. Is that the right word? I'm not sure if that's the word we're looking for. Hey, Epi, how's it going, man? Um, he's talking to Mac, and he's back in his offices. But, so they, <laughs> they all have to go to their offices for whatever reason, but no one's allowed to leave their offices. They have to stay in their offices with the closed doors, and if they want to talk to, like if he's got to talk to his assistant, he has, he has to use a video conferencing software to talk to his assistant on the other side of the door, and, <laughs> which is okay. I mean, if that, if we're, if you're protecting him from the virus, whatever, whatever, I'm not arguing with that, but what I'm arguing with is why come in the office at all? Well, if no one can actually physically interact you can do a video conference from home I mean, there's absolutely no reason to come into the i don't know it's just and with computers how they are i'm sure all of this the stuff that he needs is online anyway so it's just it has a go in chad skiles uh yeah i don't know it's just we live in a very um uh, is it dystopian are we there yet are we in a, are we in a dystopian no it's just not it's not even dystopian because dystopian implies that something you know, that society is all non-functioning or whatever, or this this horrible place, and it's not. It's functioning, but um, it's just really a- annoying. <laughs> so, so I don't know. And it, some of it doesn't make sense. Some of it does, and some of it doesn't make sense. Arkansas passed, you know, the whole crowd regulations against COVID, and you can't get into any kind of crowd unless you're in a church or in a protest. And I'm thinking, okay, protest, whatever. Those are probably young people, but churches are... <laughs> Older people, they're literally the ones most vulnerable to the virus. Why are we, why are we encouraging? I don't know. It's just crazy. <laughs> glad, glad I caught your live stream game with the Swamp Monster fight the other day. Yeah, I, I, that was a lot of fun. I had, I had a lot, a lot of fun on that one. That was really cool. Uh, I think, Willie, you were in that, weren't you? Uh, yeah, I did. For those of who don't know, I did a live stream. My first live stream on the Twitch channel. Uh, Saturday? No, Tuesday. Tuesday night. Uh, and we, we did about three hours of gameplay. It was it was a lot of fun, a lot of role playing going on, and, and a lot of cool character interactions. It was good stuff. But yeah, so we're all living in this strange, whatever, vaguely um, vaguely dysfunctional society. I mean, it's not even dysfunctional because it's functioning. We're all eating right, food's moving, and fuel's getting to where it needs. Yeah, I don't know what's going on. I do know we've lost Chuck for the day. Tim's going to jump in there and fill in, which is cool. Uh, and we will be getting into GM's tricks of the trade number. I, I'm saying it's 65, but I think Tim's telling me it's 66. i got to go in and fix all my stuff. I'm not sure how we got knocked off at 67 or some such business. But um, it's very cool. We, we've, we've done 66 of these issues. That's pretty good. Uh, Mark, last I talked to him, yeah, he uh, he was in. He went to see the doctors for some checkup and to get uh, various things. Uh, I don't know, taken care of. Uh, and the last I talked to him was yesterday, and he said he would be out for the show today. So I assume he, you know, getting in and out of a hospital is. Uh, uh, we are on sixty-seven, says Tim. Getting in and out of a hospital is challenging. <laughs> I remember when my. Uh, when my wife had her third child, I think they, our third child, <laughs> it wasn't just hers, it was my two. I think that, I want to say they wanted her to stay for 24 hours, and she was furious. She just wanted to out of the hospital. She just wanted to get, get out of the hospital and go home. It's really kind of funny. You should see how the other side of the border is handling COVID. Went to the grocery store, and they made me walk through a quarter of that spray disinfectant. <laughs> what the? Okay, I guess. I don't know. It's just a little, it's, I don't know. There seems to be this horrible discrepancy in the way states and countries and peoples are dealing with this thing, which of course means it's not going to be dealt with in any particularly, you know, good, fa- you know, whatever, consistent fashion, not good. Uh, I don't know if I'd want disinfectant spray all over me when I walked into a, a grocery store. I think I would want to avoid that, but I don't know. I, <laughs> I have no idea. 
That's crazy. Arkansas has been pretty, pretty easy going with it, I suppose, is, is the best way to do it. We didn't lock down until – we never locked down. Um, and then the mask mandate came in about two months ago or some crazy crap like that. Neil deGrasse Tyson said that having different policies in different states is like having a big section of a swimming pool. That's, that's just it. I mean, if you're not going to do a federal, and even then the federal mandate's got to be everyone calm down and move on or lock the whole everything down for until we have a vaccine, which may never, of course, happen. So really the, the approach that we're doing it is... I w- everyone keeps looking back, and I don't know shit from child. I don't. <laughs> I'm not preaching to anybody, but I, I do know that we keep looking back to 1918 and the bubonic plague, and I think we might want to look back to 1967 and 1968 with the influenza epidemic, and maybe see how we handled it in the 60s. It seems to be a little bit more coherent and a little, <laughs> a little bit less. I don't know. It's just it's interesting. But, of course, you get, and it doesn't help with the social media, and everyone gets to have an opinion, and every doctor and every whatever, and, you know, there's doctors on YouTube telling us what to do, and other doctors telling us we shouldn't be doing this. So those of us who really only only vaguely believe in things like vaccines, um, I still kind of follow the, the four humors thing. I'm not sure even, I believe in the whole we have organs type stuff. So. <laughs> but uh, I, I kind of go for the humors. <laughs> Uh, but, uh, yeah, it's just a lot of confusing information and, <laughs> and what we're supposed to do and not do and what works and doesn't work. Until we're all just so tired of it, we do, no one gives a crap anymore. <laughs> so, <laughs> I haven't decided which side I want to live on just yet, but I did get a U.S. P.O. box to save on shipping just in case. Well, there you go. Because for, the, I tell you, Epi, the, I talked about this before, the shipping to Canada or the shipping to Mexico it drives me bonkers. I get it's more expensive to go to Australia. It's more expensive to go to the United Kingdom or to Poland or Italy, France, wherever. I get that. But but literally, Mexico is right across a river. <laughs> it's right there. It's just... And hell, parts of Mexico aren't even across a river. You just got to cross a desert. I don't know. And Canada's, you know, a couple of snow banks and you're in Canada. So, uh, I don't know. That's the whole shipping to... To those to our neighbors to the north and the south it just it boggles my mind but you're probably <laughs> you're probably well placed to to actually uh get yourself a p.o box in mexico just <laughs> just to make sure because it is ridiculously expensive it is just ridiculously expensive how's it going pro all right i think uh we've babbled <laughs> babbled about the virus more than anyone wants to hear about it uh, at any point, at any given day, uh, and we can dive into GM's tricks of the trade. I'm told number 67. Uh, I'm still, I'm, I'm still fighting Tim on the numbering of this, but uh, but we'll go with him. He's got a better <laughs> command of math than I do. Uh, so uh, let's dive right into uh, tricks of the trade. So this week we're kind of now. Last week, uh, no chickens today. No, I, <laughs> I'm down in Little Rock. Uh, I'm not sure where Davis is. Uh, I talked to him about an hour ago, but. That gives him 60 minutes to get 50 miles from the point of, of our conversation. So, <laughs> so there's really no telling where Davis is at this point. But uh, yeah, so it's just it's just lonely me today and no chickens. Uh, so what we're talking we yeah, a couple of weeks ago we started talking about horror the horror genre and running horror games. Uh, and last week because us up in the mountains uh, and Davis and I were kind of hacking out some stuff. We did a I don't know what we did for Jim Tricks of the Trade. I think we did a recap or something i don't we did number i don't know whatever but we didn't address the horror so i revisited the horror we're revisiting the horror in the next three or four i think it's the next three episodes um and we'll we'll kind of beat this subject half to death archive number three is what we did last week uh so we'll beat the, the horror subject to death so today we're talking about kind of running uh, running monsters in the horror genre uh and i'm not really talking about kind of specifically monsters but things to do to enhance the both believability and the the um, the impact that the monster itself is going to have on on the other on the players at the table. So, f- and for the for the sake of this conversation, we're going to touch on the epic, but I'm really talking about single monster encounters that may be part of a bigger story, but are more than likely just a two or three session or one session, whatever uh, of of game that you're just you're just running a horror game, and it has no great, no one's conquering the world, no one's summoning the dark god or 
are you know whatever it's just it's just this terrible monster uh, has done these terrible things and it's scary and you go um, so there there that's what we're talking about <laughs> that's what we're diving into so uh <laughs> crow i don't even know what you're talking about I assume, I assume you're talking to someone in the stream. Uh, Epi, probably, I'm guessing. Uh, <laughs> I'm always confused. How's it going, Retro? Uh, but, uh, yeah, absolutely. So, uh, let's dive into it. And there's a lot of this, and I'm probably going to... Okay, to the actual stream lapse bot. Okay, there you go. <laughs> I guess I've kind of started blocking those out, too. I'm not, I don't follow those as much. But it, it all works. It all kind of, it all kind of pans out. <laughs> what did I hear today that mortified me? Some of you guys will probably really like it. Uh, Peter Bradley told me... <laughs> I'm just here to geek out. Peter Bradley told me that... Now, Peter Bradley is our uh, art guy. Heads up our art department. Whatever that's called. Art director. Jesus. Um, Willow. Somebody picked up Willow as a TV show. Now, some of you, how's it going, Rhino? Some of you, pro Art Monkey, yeah, there, there you go. Some of you probably remember the Willow movie. It came out in the 80s, I think, uh, mid-80s, something like that. And it was kind of a, kind of a, I don't know, whatever, to take on the Hobbits type thing and moving dwarves or whatever and saving, I can't remember, I don't even remember what the movie was about, but I didn't care for it that much. Um, I don't know why it was too kind of lovey-dovey for me, I'm, I like it a little bit more grim and realistic. But for those of you who like the Willow franchise, apparently it's going to be a TV show uh, rolling down the pipe. Ron Howard is somehow involved. That's that, that was that's my news my my geek news item of the day. Love the subject though. Great topic. Making monsters really scary. The table can be a challenge. It's very challenging. I think you're right. So let's with with crows <laughs> with with crows uh, uh, redirecting us back to to subject on hand because God knows why I got on Willow, but. Uh, uh, let's in. Yeah, had Val Cameron. Yeah, he was he was good in it. I liked Val Cameron and I liked the dragon, but the rest of it just it just didn't it didn't resonate with me. I'm not I'm not really sure why. And I like fairy tales, and that's sort of what we're talking about right now is fairy tales. So one of the things that I I would recommend that you do as you're prepping for um, as you're prepping for some kind of scary adventure, scary horror based adventure. Is to, die, is to start reading some, some fairy tales. Just at four, five, six, ten of them, it doesn't matter. Most of them are very short, three or four or five pages. Just to kind of get you an idea of this element of, this human element, this moral ele element, uh, and the horrors tied with it. I mean, obviously, Hansel and Gretel has a, a scary aspect to it. Uh, Cinderella certainly does uh, with greed and, you know, all of these other uh, vanity and other, other things that are tied into it. And then um, the Pied Piper, of course, that classically taking the children away to, to kill them in whatever a mountain stronghold. So just reading a few fairy tales, I think, will help you kind of get your head into the mindset of a monster. And that's what you want to do. And you don't want to get you don't want to go with the, the tropes of the monsters just getting treasure or he's just a bad guy. Uh, we're going to talk here in a little bit about motivations um, for the monster. And the more you kind of do that, the better off, the more believable the monster becomes. And fairy tales, as, as uh, unbelievable as fairy tales are, they have this germ of, of truth in them. But because they're mostly, they're designed actually to impart a moral... Um, or some kind of lesson. That's really what fairy tales are generally designed to do. We all ignore the AIs among us until they suddenly strike and take over everything, even tell you stream. Oh, that's scary. There you go. <laughs> Thanks for the bits, Crow. <laughs> yeah. It's funny, I was I watched and I I I, I sort of don't want to sound critical or as, as a negative review, but I watched uh, someone's review of Pinocchio and um, they they were kind of hammering Pinocchio pretty hard, the movie, because of its Christian overtones. Um, you know, there's just all kinds of things in there that, are, that have these Christian overtones. And I was, I, was watching, I was watching it, and I was just laughing the whole time, thinking, honestly, the whole purpose of a fairy tale is, and a, and a, a fable is to impart a moral a lesson in it. And for a Pinocchio, which was written by a Christian, in a Christian society for a Christian audience. If it didn't have Christian un 
overtones in it or undertones, whatever the word is, it would be a disaster. <laughs> it would not be very good. It would have been poorly written. Uh, but that's that's kind of the purpose of fairy tales is to convey this this message across. And sort of at the end of the day, horror has that. If you want to if you want to humanize it, and that's what we'll be talking about in the next trick. If you want to humanize it, you want to have some kind of relatable emotion or uh, something that the the some kind of uh, response that you're going to you know pull out of the plate or something that they can associate with. That's what I'm looking for. The other would have been burned at the stake. <laughs> uh, let's see. And also, we would not have, have ever, <laughs> ever have heard of it. Uh, da, 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 the author would have heard of the stag. Yeah, I tell you, it's just very interesting. And by looking at fairy tales from other countries, like Norwegian or Japanese or wherever, it can give you a lot of new ideas and scenarios other than the ones everyone knows. Absolutely, that's a great idea, great. Because there's all societies have it, right? They all have these stories and these parables and these fables that they, they tell. And most of them have some kind of evil creature, evil monster, a witch, some kind of human that's done something horribly wrong. Uh, I mean, Hansel and Gretel really, it's on my mind mostly because of the movie I just watched, Gretel and Hansel. But um, that's kind of the perfect example of this normal people, very normal situation, a walk through the woods. Though not really because they were thrown out by their dad to starve to death. Uh, ends up in this house of this cannibal witch. I mean, it's, there's, so there's things in these fables uh, that can, you can really pull on. Pinocchio would not have been so popular if it wasn't relatable to major religious figures. Absolutely. I mean, that's just the thing. That's all of these, all of these fables have an undercurrent in them that's to teach someone a lesson. Now, of course, we've sanitized it. Uh, you know, in the 1900s, no, 1800s, it was these things, the fairy tales were largely sanitized for a broader audience as printing became more, you know, popular and book reading became more popular and and all these things became serialized, especially in England and whatnot. Um, so it, the, the nature of them changes, but at, at their heart, they're still evil in these fairy tales, whether it's the stepmother or the Pied Piper or whoever it is. Uh, I guess in Pinocchio, it's the... It's the two... There's like a shop owner or something, the carnival owner. I can't... It's been so long since... I don't know much about Pinocchio. It's been a million years since I've... I don't know that I've ever read Pinocchio. I certainly saw the Disney movie, but I don't know that I've ever read it. But at any rate, so just read some fairy tales. Both those from Europe, from our Anglo-Saxon heritage, and also from the Germanic heritage. I guess Angles and Saxons are Germanic. Uh, and like Grape Ape mentioned, other go to other cultures as well. Korea, Japanese... Uh, I've got a whole book of fairy tales from Central Africa that are just fantastic. And there's there's just all kinds of stuff that <coughs> you'll be able to borrow from. Because it really takes the real and makes it fantastic in order to get its moral across. Uh, and that just gives you an idea of where, where you want to go with magic, where you want to go with uh, something other than the, the mundane, you know, other than the whatever, the serial killer, whatever. All right, so without Chuck today, I had to, I had to put these panels together. So we'll see if I actually managed to get it. I, I had to do this once, and I forgot to update the GM trick part, but I think I got them all this time around. We're going to go into GM's trick of the trade number two. And this is probably the most important thing for me running a horror game. And this is to humanize the your villain, your monster. And it doesn't mean like if your monster is a manticore, you want to give them human aspects. But if you want to really scare someone, you want to give them something that's very relatable, the players that they can relate to. And if you give these people, give this monster some kind of human motivation, whether it's uh, love or whatever emotion like that, uh, hunger, it doesn't matter. You can borrow from the seven deadly sins, whatever it is, greed. Just give them some kind of... You just give them a greater human aspect than you normally might do. If you take, like, um, the vampire is a perfect example. If, if you just make the vampire into this super powerful villain that can kill just about anything and raise the dead uh, and bring wolves and bats to him, then he's just kind of this monster who has special abilities that, are, that happen to be attached to darkness. Uh, you know, to, to evil. Not darkness isn't the right word, but evil. Uh, squirt gun at the table. <laughs> there you go. But uh, the uh, but if you humanize them, if you take that same character, that vampire, like Lestat from the was it the Vampire Chronicles? Is that what that is? And you humanize them, and suddenly, if you take those two vampires, I, I can't remember. It's been I don't I've never read the books. I only saw the movie. So it's Lestat and the other guy 
played by Brad Pitt, if you take these two vampires and suddenly they're very human and they have human emotions and they have human desires, yet they are monsters inside, uh, especially the Brad Pitt character, you can't... Uh, it's, ter it's terrifying. I mean, it's horrible to look at that because then you can relate because you have those same... You have those same drives, even if you suppress them. Um, it's just something that you can really relate to. It makes it a little bit more real, a little bit more terrible, because it's real. When we read about serial killers, the reason it's so horrifying is because it's so very, very real. It's, it's not like, I mean, when you read, I don't know, what is it, Bobby, Bobby R., Bobby, Bobby R., this is a book about the horrible genocide in Russia that the Ansatz group used... Uh, during World War II, um, that becomes this kind of mind-numbing, it's, it's, it's horrible beyond imagining, because it's beyond imagining. But when we get into Lestat's character, we can kind of associate. This is just someone who has... Uh, Louis, yes. Uh, it's Louis, I guess. Yeah, Louis. Uh, it's a very good movie. It's an insanely good movie. Uh, I'm assuming I'm masking you as a bot there. Tim, are we being... <laughs> are we being... Deliverance, <clears throat> Deliverance for free. Deliverance is a good movie too. <laughs> now that I'm asking you, <laughs> brings it up. Deliverance has that very. You look at the villains in Deliverance, and it's it's this. <laughs> well, this bot helped me kind of make my point here. It's very well timed there. Deliverance is a terrifying movie because of these these what is what do the Trailer Park Boys call them? The the hillbillies, <laughs> the, the hillbillies. They're scary because there's something that we can relate to. There's something that we can believe is actually there, right? So these hillbillies in um in the <laughs> uh, these hillbillies in the where I can't remember where Deliverance takes place, Tennessee, I think, um, become very real because that's something that we can encounter. That's something we could go into the woods and run into people like that, and it's absolutely terrifying. Um, but um, so humanize them. So take your Take your villain and make them just more human than human. And that, of course, line comes from the movie Blade Runner. Um, I can't remember where that line is. I don't think Roy Batty says it, more human than human. Or maybe he does. Is it the... No, it's uh, the, sci the the engineer, the, the chess player, I think, says it, more human. I don't know. I can't remember where he says it. But it's, it's the perfect thing. Uh, it's that has a double meaning in it, of course, because in, in Blade Runner, the androids are being made to be more human than human, but as they are able to develop emotions over time. Um, but um, I think it's the Tyrell Corporation slogan. I can't remember. I gotta go watch Blade Runner again. Uh, White Zombie said it best. All right, here it comes, retro. But uh, yeah, so just make the make the villains human. Give them some kind of human aspects to their characters. Uh, that the, the the players can actually relate to. Uh, while we're waiting for Retro Zombie to uh, to quote White Zombie, our Retro Gamer, to quote White Zombie, I want to welcome everybody for GM's Tricks of the Trade number 67. We sure appreciate you stopping by. If you have not, please give us a follow. Uh, we are here every Thursday at 4 o'clock and jibber-jabbering about jamming and all kinds of goobly goop. I don't know what White Zombie said, Retro, so you're going <laughs> to have to type it out. Uh, isn't that a band? Is White Zombie a band? It's not Blue Oyster Cult or Blondie, so I'm not, <laughs> I'm not sure where it lands on the spectrum. Uh, yeah, humanize your villain. Humanize your monster. Give him something. Uh, give him, they have a song called More Human Than Human. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> maybe, that's where, maybe that's where Philip K. Dick got it, or probably vice versa. I just can't remember in the movie he said more human than human as part of the chorus. There you go. I can't remember. Now I'm going to have to look it up because it's driving me absolutely crazy. Uh, literally, Blade Runner is one of the few movies I've actually been able to quote my entire life because I've watched the movie so many times. Uh, but it's been a, a while. Let's see. Blade Runner. More human. It pops up. There's so many insanely memorable. Look, White Zombies. <laughs> White Zombies thing came up. Yeah, <laughs> that's fantastic. Where does he say it? Ah, they just—they're just—they're just showing. Just show oh, so it's. Okay. I'm gonna turn that. Can you guys hear that? Colors is our goal here at Tyrell. More human than human is our motto. 
Rachel is an experiment, nothing more. So oh, it's it's uh, it's Tyrell. Tyrell actually says that in the scene where uh, they use the Voight comp on Rachel's character, and it takes uh, what's his name, um, Deckard, so very very long to discover that she's actually an android because she doesn't know it. Uh, and then Tyrell says, "Commerce is our business here. More human than human is our motto." Uh, and I have to listen to the song though. But uh, how's it going, Thaler? But yeah, I mean that's what you, that basically said, it, it, what you have in Blade Runner is the perfect example of taking a villain, taking a monster, and making it more human uh, than more human than monster. That way, your players can latch onto that and believe what's going on, and the whole thing becomes a little bit more, just a little bit more. Um, all right, with that, uh, I'm gonna we're gonna dive into trick of the trade number three. Let's see if. And we get a Dr. Pepper, too. Let's see if we did it. Focus their evil. So this is another thing that... Uh, I ran a horror game not too long ago. And I thought it went fairly well. Uh, though some of the players got a bit frustrated because they couldn't unravel the plot as quickly as they normally could. But uh, one of the things that, that I, I learned in the course of that is to keep your villains... To keep them uh, very focused. Uh, if you're doing that, again, to, to reiterate, we're really kind of talking about games that you're running two or three, one, two, three sessions that's just got, that's just a horror genre game. You're not really trying to conquer the world or summon the dark god or what, whatever. Uh, whatever evil god, the red god that you're plundering the earth with. We're just kind of talking about running typical games. So take your villain. You've already humanized it. Uh, you've made it a little bit have a, the, the shell of humanity about it so that it's got motivations that your players can understand and now focus its evil don't don't focus it on conquest quest of the world or overthrowing this religion or destroying this ancient whatever um, focus its evil take whatever human aspect you gave it whatever whether it's greed or lust or whatever emotion that you kind of tied to your thing uh, and narrow its focus on, on whatever it's trying to uh, whatever it's trying to do whatever it's trying to achieve wait what is it? yeah so if it's all very very believable and it's all very very real and they can they can grasp it a little bit better uh, the game I ran Tuesday which was kind of a horror game it kind of had that sense about it was built with that kind of in mind it was really just these gnolls kidnapped this woman to take to sell her to the hag so she she could have some food they're basically just feeding the hag there's no there's no other huge thing going on here there's no you know armies of gnolls or the hags trying to seize the crown of the you know whatever it's literally just food for her so the character's job is to interdict between the meal and the hag. Uh, and the whole thing becomes kind of believable. I even at one point had the hag put a cake out trying to distract the players off. And the whole thing was, it was really just, that whole moment was really designed to just bring it all back down to make sure that everybody can kind of see, yes, this is real. This is just interactions between small creatures in a, in a, very, in a very broad world. And that's what most of our interactions in life are. They're small things as, as huge as they are to us, right? Something horrible happens to you or an accident, a speeding ticket, like I got out of wake or whatever. This momentous thing to you in the big picture of the world, it's very small. I mean, it's not going to resonate very much for the most part. There's, <laughs> there's occasionally that that breaks. Uh, yeah, Knowles and aired with a with a fighter splay down on a wagon wheel, arms twisted in between the spokes of the wheel. Yeah, I remember. <laughs> Ultra Magnus was there. Well, that was that. Was what I was trying to convey there is a sense of uh, just what I mean, and that's what evil does. And it, but it's very focused. Everything was extraordinarily focused. I didn't want it to go beyond, you know, and didn't want it to go beyond. I didn't want it to be this big, epic shape shaping thing. It's just something. Local, and this is my picture here of the, the headless horseman. He's just a local haunt. He's not, you know, terrorizing the planet. He's not whatever. He's just, I don't, I, don't, I haven't read that play or that poem in 7,000 years, but he's just Smoky Holler. Is that it? Yeah, it's a Smoky Holler, right? <clears throat> he's just terrorizing that one area. 
So if you focus the evil, if you make it uh, make it smaller rather than big, then you're going to have a better chance of capturing their attention. You've humanized your villain, uh, and now that you focus the evil, it's all very right here, and it's it becomes a little bit more real than these grandiose, epic, thematic elements. <laughs> That's not how he was in Sleepy Hollow. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I never saw the TV show. <laughs> I need to check it out, but if I remember correctly, he's just haunting, right? He just haunts. I can't even remember why. It's been so long. It's a poem, right? It's not a story. I think it's a poem, um, and it, he's really just haunting Sleepy Hollow, and I can't remember why now, and it's really where the whole pumpkin thing comes from and all that. It's just this great story. Uh, it's just this great kind of contained thing, and really one of the scariest movies, slasher movies, if you will, and I don't care for slasher movies because they're just, I don't know, they're just... At a certain point, it's just bone and gristle and blood, and who cares? And then now you're just jumping because something jumped at you. Or or you're doing like the, the Saw movies, and it's just gross. They're just kind of trying to be disgusting for disgusting sake. Well, that's easy to make people wince if you're going to be disgusting. That's, I mean, that's really easy to do. Yeah, any little bit of description. I tried to do it. I tried to pull a little bit of that in the game the other day, and when I described the guy that Ultra is talking about, the, the, the drover who was kind of tangled into the wheel. That part to me, I just wanted to, to convey torture and the, the evil nature of the gnolls, but I wanted to make it real, and that's when I described a little hook that was stuck in his intestines to pull his intestines out. A little bit of that is good. A little bit of that gives you a flavor uh, of just the, the sheer terror of what you're facing. When uh, Hannibal Lecter does the, you know, with the eating the fava beans or whatever he says, that's terrifying. He's talking about wine and fava beans and doing this hissing sound, and it's, it's all so very visual and real. But if you're watching the Saw movies, I've watched one of them, you know, after an hour or so, it's just, eh, ow, eh, that hurts. You know, it's just, you're not terrified anymore. You're not kind of lost in this moment. You're just, you're just wincing a lot. <laughs> you're just kind of going, ah, I have a blood spray. And what was it, the reanimator, the animator, whatever that stupid movie was? a great movie whatever <laughs> you enjoyed it um, but yeah so if you focus the evil in and kind of zero in on details like that then you can you, you you enhance the idea that this is real in the player's mind that it's not something that goes way beyond and into the into the stratosphere of their understanding and I think so many uh, so many games so many sessions so many movies comic books everything they just take it too far they just go too far and it's not scary uh, and they think they're being scary, but they break their own, they break their own stride and go into the unreal. And you're like, well, it's because as soon as you break that bubble, right? Once once you're under that suspension of disbelief, it's done. You're you're out. You might be grossed out, but you're you're done being scared. Now you just 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 gross stuff. Clearly communicated and set the pace of the game. These are not the regular two hit dice nulls, and maybe they were, but maybe they were, but it didn't matter to us. <clears throat> Yeah, well, that's that's one of the things that when I really, when I set up the scenario, it really started with a trickle of blood that was coming down the hill. Uh, I wanted it, I wanted the blood to be somewhere that it shouldn't be, right? But I didn't, it not like a wave of intestines you know, or whatever. It's just a trickle bit of blood. So it's here and it, it just draws everybody's attention to it. One, it does one of those things I like to do, and I talk about this a lot in these GM Tricks of the Trade, is to bring color into it, uh, especially stark color, and blood is very stark, and uh, red, is, I should say, is very stark. So that kind of set the tone. The funny thing about that encounter, Ultra, I had the next stage of it was when, I think, Willie, weren't you the, the primal druid? When the primal druid was going up and was to go over, the first thing the druid was supposed to see was the man laying there with his hand, but then he got knocked off camera and we had to adjust very, very suddenly, and I completely forgot to do the description of the man laying at the top who was actually bleeding down the hill. So it was, it was kind of, it was a little bit interrupted there. Um, but that's what I was going for, is I really wanted to set the tone that these gnolls are ferocious and they're evil and they're unforgiving and they're, they're something to be reckoned with. Whether they're, you're tough or not enough, you'll, you'll learn that soon enough. And of course, the gnolls really had very little to do with the, the, whole, the overall adventure. They were really just to kind of get you to, to, to draw you into what I wanted you to fight, which was the worm and the hag in the, in the woods. The abject spectacle, but thank you for that. I much appreciated the compliment, Ultra Magnus. The abject spectacle of it pulls you out of 
suspending your disbelief if it's just gore, 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 gore. Yeah, that's exactly right, DM. And it really, and there's a lot of movies. Oh, and I, that's what I started to say is one of my favorite of those slasher films. And I don't like them normally. It's the first Halloween. Now, that first Halloween is downright terrifying because it's just a mental patient who has escaped. There's no, now later they go crazy with it, but if you're just watching it on the surface, it's just someone who murdered his parents or some, murdered somebody, uh, I can't remember anymore, and he's escaped the mental, the, the, the asylum, and now he's out. So now you've got this homicidal maniac who's put a mask on for whatever reason, and that's scary, it's very, very real. Now, his supernatural aspects, I think, come later when they have to kill him and they have to bring him back. Honestly, that's a franchise that should have died at movie one. Should have never been a franchise. And then it would be a classic horror movie like uh, Silence of the Lambs. Just, of course, I guess there's more Silence of the Lambs stuff. That, but, but it's one of those movies that should have just kind of stuck. It, it was just great, 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 great story. The Friday the 13th always missed because they didn't humanize the villain. He's just some dude who comes out and you can chop him up with chainsaws and he's back at you. It's just ridiculous. How were they able to defeat an old god? He wasn't very strong for a god. <laughs> they didn't defeat the old god at all. The old just sold the woman to the hag uh, and went on. But what I, what I was trying to convey to convey there is the sheer um, the nature of the Knowles and an aired and I really need to, the next codex will have this more explained because I noticed it's not really in it. In the world of aired, uh, Knowles are ferociously vicious creatures. Their only purpose is to fight. They have no other purpose. They, there's no part of their genetic wiring that you can deal in peace and, and love and try to come to an accord with a knoll. You're just not going to do it. Uh, they love to fight. If you're not fighting them, then they're, they're just assuming that you need to be killed so that they can go find something else to fight. Uh, I don't use them often for that reason because I don't want them... I don't want 48 million homicidal maniacs running around, <laughs> running around the world of Earth. But that's their nature. Their nature is to is to to wage war. They're just extraordinarily aggressive creatures, uh, and they carry that over because their gods are evil and they are evil. It just it just carries over. But they did not actually fight the, the noble god. Uh, in aired in my games, you don't ever fight gods. It's just there's not any fighting gods. I don't even stat gods out. In fact, enough gods and monsters too that we've got coming out. We're not statting anything. There's not going to be armor classes or any of that crap. Gods really are not meant to be fight, fought. They're just meant to, uh, uh, you know, do whatever gods do. Whatever they do in your campaign. So I wanted this part number four is just kind of reiterating number three. Because in number three, we're talking about focus your evil. Uh, and in number four, uh, it's kind of the same thing. Extraordinary Vicious Warrior sounds like my first two deployments. <laughs> yeah, there you go, Crow. Yeah. <laughs> you don't want to have any of that brought back to you, of course, but. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of the way I, I, I wanted something. Bugbears are sort of this way. I just don't like the name Bugbear, but I wanted something in air that's just... Because there are warriors that and, I, and it, that fight for the nature, for just for fighting, right? Not evil. That has nothing to do with it. Now, gnolls are evil in air, but there are some that just love to fight, and it's just the way it is. Um, especially when hungry, they get hungry, wet, or tired. It gets worse and worse as the, <laughs> as the levels of discomfort go Reminds me of an interview I saw uh, the first Gulf War where we were doing the um, what was it, the second? Might have been it. Might have been the second. I can't remember where we were doing where we were moving. We we're putting troops forward in forward bases with you know supplying the helicopters so that the infantry and the tanks could, could catch up with them in Iraq. And the press were at one of these things. And uh, the um, I can't remember exactly what she said, but she said something like, are you, do you have enough food? Are you, I mean, you're way out here in front. Do you have blah, blah, blah? And he goes, we are always hungry. We never have enough food. Now, I had just got out of the Army. Uh, so this would have been a second, because I had been in the Army. This, this would have been a second go for it. And I said, as soon as he said, they don't give us enough food here. We're, we're, we're always hungry. I'm thinking, uh-huh. I was in the Army. I was always hungry. <laughs> and I wasn't even deployed to a war zone. So <laughs> you're probably getting enough food. You just... Just want more, <laughs> because it's just really, it's hard. You get hungry easy. Any attempts to deal with HP, I find that this mechanism archaic. There has to be something better that drives the story. Taking 1d4 damage out of 50 hit points really doesn't mean anything. If I got jabbed, it's going to hurt. I might, it might slow me down from knolls. I'm trying to escape down a mountain and limping over stones. It might be poison. It just, it's just more exciting than roll a dice. You take X damage. Well, what I do, Fowler, because, and this is, we, I talk about this a bit in these, in these streams. You know, at the end of the day, we've got to have some kind of mechanic that actually um, 
governs what is happening at the table, whether it's you know how to hit or how far the spell goes or whatever is going on. And hit points, as cumbersome as they can be, and as unrealistic as they can be, because I know some systems have... Uh, how's it going, Green Lunton? Some systems have hit points for the arms and the torsos and heads. I don't do that just because it's too much to keep up with. To keep up with, but uh, you've got to have some kind of mechanic. Now that said, what I try to do when if I'm trying to convey some kind of horror is I personalize the damage somewhat. Uh, I didn't do it a lot in the game I ran Tuesday, but you'll notice well, when I'm talking, like I'll be describing the swings, and it won't be one swing. So say Ultra Magnus swings and he misses. Okay, Ultra, you swing and you, you, you rain blows on the shield. You hit it three or four times and you get past his arm guard, but it's just the creature's too tough, too strong. So I try to make the action in the round bigger than the, the dice themselves say. And then when there's actual damage, uh, I kind of go in the direction that you're hinting at. It's, I use descriptive text to make it very, very believable. Uh, it slices the bridge of your nose. Uh, the, the mace blow is so hard on the side of your helmet that it explodes the globe of your eye and your eye kind of rolls back into your head. Uh, you know that it's going to take days to heal because I don't want to blind anybody. You know, cuts off the tip of your finger. And it's, it's, it's just something like that and that brings the, that nature of the hit points into this kind of gruesome, I don't, that's not the right word, but this kind of realistic, you know, realistic thing. So that's generally, Thaler, that's generally how I handle the hit point thing to keep your mechanic alive uh, and not abandon it, but also to have some kind of you know, emotive reaction going on at the table. Now that's, I, I reverse that as well. I want the monsters to be eviscerated and, and damaged and whatnot. So the whole thing just becomes kind of a little bit more real. If you are going in the army, always go the beef stew in our head, the jalapeno cheese. There you go. Every morning when I put on my uniform, I instantly became hungry and I wanted to take <laughs> That sounds about right. Yeah, I was hungry all the time. I was constantly sticking crap in my pockets when we went out in the field. I just, I, I was just always hungry. Spoken like a true grunt. Yeah, there you go. 442 FA, not a grunt, though. I was in the medic for the gun bunnies. I was a combat signaler. So when I went out, I was always in the bush doing something. I was always hungry. Jalapeno cheese spread was a form of currency. <laughs> we need to get the veterans in here to write a, a book on how to, stay, how to feed yourself and stay alive in the, in the adventuring environment. Always take care of your, your supply guy and your dog. Oh, yeah. Always got the beef stew because I, I had the Motrin... <laughs> it had the motion. I liked the um, the chicken a la king, believe it or not. I really like the chicken a la king, and I don't like chicken, which is very strange. If I say that, I'm probably going to have KFC for dinner tonight. <laughs> so, notice how he said he doesn't want to, to blind someone. GM say that, but, don't, but I don't think they mean it. Yeah, I try not to permanently maim characters unless I know they'll play it well. Um, but I will, and of course you've got heal spells, so you can fix it. But I will definitely do things that cause damage that takes time to heal. Um, that's okay. KFC is, that's not really, it's barely chicken anymore. Uh, so I, I, anything Fowler to kind of make it real, but back to the Epic. Um, so save the Epic for something for a campaign arc, save the, the summoning Unklar, the horned God to destroy the world or banishing, you know, the evil demon for a, an, an, ar an arc. It's going to go 10, 12, 30, 40 games, something like that. And then build your evil, weave your evil in and out of your sessions. And don't, if you're just trying to do a horror thing, just keep it all very, very real. And I put the picture of Gollum up here for a very specific reason because he's the perfect example of that. Gollum himself, taken in and of himself, is a terrifying little creature. He murdered his friend. Uh, he lives under the in the dark, and he strangles goblins and eats them for food. He eats fish raw, uh, and the way he talks in riddles and rhymes, and he talks to himself and to the ring. He's a, he's a scary little creature, you know, that lives in the dark that Frodo, no, who's the other guy? Bilbo, that Bilbo stumbles upon and now has to to wrangle through this, this riddle battle to get out of it. And then even later, uh, the things that Gollum does, they're never epic. He doesn't care anything about, well, the very final act, I suppose, is he doesn't care anything about world domination or Sauron or... Saruman or Gandalf or any of this crap, Gondor or any of it. He wants the ring back. He wants to get the ring and go back to his house and eat fish and strangle goblins like he's been doing for the previous 500 years. And that's just a little murderous creature. Uh, so Gollum becomes this kind of perfect example of how not to do the epic. Uh, he's strung into this epic campaign 
Um, but he's just a small part of it. He's just a, a small part of that story. So um, that type of that type of character, that type of monster, is kind of what I'm talking about to avoid the epic. Now that doesn't mean because I I have run my big game that led into the creation of the Codex of Eric was actually just that the Dark God had conquered the Earth, uh, had conquered Eric, and he needed to be banished. So we ran the game for years, not three years, until they actually successfully banished the Dark God. So that is sort of a horror campaign arc, but the vast majority of games, the vast majority of the games, were not horror-based at all. So that's kind of what I'm talking about. And save the epic for your for your campaigns uh, and keep your keep your guy fo- focused. He eats he eats fish raw. Hey. <laughs> well, there you go. Well, the way he eats them, though, he just doesn't he just grab them and and bash him on a rock <laughs> and just eat him. If he didn't just see me as being Gollum, then all I can say is my precious. <laughs> Not doing the epics of describing a child along the corpse of its mother after the null attack. Describe the look of horror and sore on that face and that it could it could happen just as easy. Yeah, that's perfect example, Crow. Absolutely perfect example. You've narrowed it all down into a very, very real, very focused moment that has nothing to do with anything other than this this terrible loss that this child has occurred. And now what are you, the hero, is going to do about it to remedy it, make it right, whatever it is uh, that you're going for. Yeah, focus. Just keep the, focus the whole thing. Epics are great. I love epic games. I always run arcs. By the time they're fourth level, I'm usually, I've am usually i usually developed this huge kind of story arc in my head that I'm feeding into. But for horror games, keep it simple, keep it focused, uh, humanize them, and just keep it all, all the way down. Now this last part, uh, this last trick of the trade, number five, role play them. Now, I'm actually going to take a second. I want to open up what next week's will be if I can find it. Hold on, 30 seconds. I was almost prepared for this stream, so that's that's the trigger. Oops, whoops. Okay, yeah. So that's next week. Okay, so so this last part is kind of take your monsters and try to role play. Now this is something I didn't do in the game Tuesday. We were really kind of running out of time. I kind of I had intended to role play the hag out a little bit more. But the clock was running out, and we had to kind of wrap it up, and I knew it was going to be a hard fight coming forward. Um, but the idea is the hag herself, who was just looking for a meal and had purchased this woman from the Knolls, uh, the hag herself, was there was going to be some role-playing in to see if they could convince her to give up the woman, you know, trade something, pay, whatever, what have you. But um, I, I just ran out of time. But the idea is is that you take you take this human humanized villain, this humanized monster, uh, that you focused in on whatever particular aspect of the creature is evil or drives its evil or motivates it, its emotion, whatever, and role play it. If you can at all possibly role play uh, with the with the players, with this villain, before the actual encounter occurs, and that's why it's better to have a couple of sessions that you're doing these things, um, then do it. Because then they, they create this bond with the creature, good or bad, Possibly, it's going to be this gray area. They create this bond with the creatures that um, maybe influences the way they think and act, and maybe makes them hesitate. And it just makes it even that much more real, that much more relatable. Uh, that now they've got a little bit more quandary to deal with. And at the end of the day, part of the horror, part of the aspect of horror, is dealing with the unknown. It, right? Is trying to 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 dissect the unknown in a rapid fashion without getting killed and all of these things if if this villain if this villain is just eating children all day then obviously <laughs> you know killing it is the thing to do the little dude in saw with the eyeball thing that whatever he's got the twirly eyes or <laughs> what i don't know what's going on yeah you want to kill that guy you want to <laughs> you want to take a mallet and bash him into pole but uh, if it's the witch in Hansel and Gretel and she's offered you refuge and she's fed you and she's given you some place to sleep and she's trying to teach you magic, maybe you don't want to kill her. Maybe she's not so bad. Or maybe you can look over her bad parts. Um, and that's specifically what I did in the horror game I ran a few months ago is they encountered the witch a number of times and I tried to very, very humanize her. And there's a few role-playing sessions that, that played out very nicely. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> and scared is also missing feeding time when you when you own. 
there you go. <laughs> My Egyptian style game starts back up this weekend. Really looking forward to running it. Very cool, Green Lunton. I assume that you've got. Uh, I assume you've got the Codex Egyptian in hand. <clears throat> I absolutely as I sent some notifications out on the Kickstarter today, and if you go to our Kickstarter, hell, I'll just I'll post the I'll post the Kickstarter link here. And you can go to it and you can see one of my favorite moments in Egyptian, uh, whatever, storytelling, I'm not sure. Um, if you click it and just go within the first like paragraph, you'll see Yul Brenner delivering his Ramses, uh, so let it be written, so let it be done. Let's see if I can get the sound going. So let it be written. So let it be done. <laughs> I love all things Egypt. I love the dress. I love the mythology. I love the terrain. Everything about Egypt I find absolutely fascinating. And it's just, it's just awesome. And as a species, so far as my vote goes, I think the Egyptians win for the coolest looking... It's not costumes, it's their dress. <laughs> Decorum? I don't know. Whatever. Uh, just fashion sense. There we go. For the coolest fashion sense. The Egyptians just look badass. <laughs> they were just cool. I think a runner up, the, the second up, are the Native Americans. The Native Americans just look badass. <laughs> they just look freaking cool. Especially the Pawnee. I'm very fond of the Pawnee and their, their huge headdresses with the, the, they used animal fat, I think, to, to spike out their hair and war paint. I just, the, the Pawnee looked great. But yeah, I'm a huge, absolutely a huge fan of Egypt. Well, everyone uh, get to throw the back cover D D on the PHP if it reaches that goal or is that a different order? No, so what's going to happen on that, uh, we did a poll on the cat. So to catch people up, we're running a, a Kickstarter right now to bring out the eighth printing of the Player's Handbook. Uh, you can go visit it at that link. Uh, if you're not sure what the Player's Handbook is for Castles and Crusades, you can download it. It's there on the site, so snatch it, have a, have a look at it. Um, but um, we the cover on this book will be the cover that you see on that Kickstarter, and it's a tribute to the original AD&D book, of course, the demon eyeball jewels thing. So the next stretch reward at 35000 I think, is Jason's going to take the Ifrit cover from the DMG and do a tribute cover to that one as well. I talked to him yesterday and today. He's already begun sketching. He's got his ideas going on. Uh, a tent-foot pole? A tent-foot pole or a tent-foot pole? Uh, but uh, so, so yes, what's going to happen now is the Castle Keeper's Guide... Uh, which is already in the works. Uh, we've got the third printing already, and we're most of the way through editing it, I think, so layout should begin soon. So we're going to give an option over at that Kickstarter. Uh, if you're a backer of that Kickstarter, you can choose which version you want, the one with the tribute to the Ifrit or the one with the Peter Bradley on there that's got the, him holding up the book and whatnot. Um, so, yeah, Green, you'll be able to hop in there and choose, and then we'll do the same thing on our site after the Kickstarter delivers. We'll have both options up where you can buy either book, whichever one you want, and go with it. Uh, so, super excited about that. That, I gotta say, uh, Jason did, did, he outdid himself with his art on that on that tribute cover. I mean, it just looks fantastic. Uh, and what his conception of what he's going to do with the Ifrit cover is always, already very, very cool. I might try to guide him a little bit, but I don't think so. I really don't like to guide too much with the artist because it, then I get something stuck in my head, and if they don't deliver it, even if what they have is very cool, it's my head's like, eh, it's not what I wanted. So I try to just back out, and it, it works much better. I'm back to PDF, the CK guide. How do I upgrade to the HD? So when we get it, we'll move it to backer kit, and when we move it to backer kit, you can adjust your pledges at that point and add things to it or, or what have you. Uh, so it should not it should not be hard to do, and it'll be at least another month before we move it to backer kit. I'm trying to get, I've been talking to Mac off and on all day, uh, trying to get a good hard and fast date on when he's going to be done editing that book. Uh, he's run into a few problems of his own, COVID related, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but, um, so hopefully we'll, it'll all kind of put together. But yeah, definitely in back of it. Well, so that's it. So next week, what we're going to do, we're going to continue this horror theme and I'm going to talk about um, triggers, things I use to actually uh, kind of trigger that horror that horror sense to, to bring things a little bit more to life. We talked about monsters this time. We're going to talk about the triggers next time to help kind of, you know, snap them into the whole thing. And then after that, we're going to talk about uh, something we already touched on uh, with Fowler's question on things to do actually mechanically wise to make uh, the whole thing a little bit scarier. 
trying to think if we've got and then and then we're then we're done with horror i believe so uh, yeah, a couple of more a couple of more tricks of the trade on horror uh and then we'll move on to other topics uh let's see great news upgrading to the leather i figured that but it was figured i'd ask should i make the the part spend half the day traveling through the desert <laughs> yes 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 absolutely always yes make them travel uh, overland is fantastic it gives you so many opportunities to do so many things and introduce npcs monsters encounters the terrain uh, to use weather to force them to use spells yes i guess green a thousand times yes well, that's it for us today, um, and we will be back next Tuesday for Ask Me Anything. We'll try to have Davis on as well, and then again on Thursday for GM Tricks of the Trade, and of course, 7 o'clock on Wednesday, we do Haunted Holler, and we're gearing up to do for me to do more live games here on the, the Troll channel, so join us for that too. Uh, thank you all for showing up. I surely do appreciate it. Crow, Grape Ape, Green Lantern, Rhino Fowler, everybody. Love the comments and questions. Let's keep them coming, and we will see you Tuesday. All right, all. <laughs> Take it easy. See you later, Evie, DM, and Commander. All right, how do I stop this thing? Stop. There we go. All right. <laughs>